Hello, welcome to Account Instruction Help and How To. In this lecture, we're going to talk about auditing of the purchasing process. The purchasing process main account we're looking into is the accounts payable. So the accounts payable, it's kind of like the accounts payable process when we have the purchases that are going to go through the accounts payable, oftentimes being inventory, and then we're going to pay off the accounts payable. So note what we're doing now is we're basically going through some of those balance sheet accounts and income statement accounts and drilling down on these accounts and getting an understanding of those accounts and testing those particular accounts the main one here being accounts payable but as we test accounts payable we will be doing testing in the process of the other accounts that are going to be involved within the purchasing process we will be able to at the end of this explain the purchasing process list types of transactions in the purchasing process list types of accounts in the purchasing process describe types of documents in the purchasing process, explain internal controls as it relates to the purchasing process, and describe substantive tests uh, related to the purchasing process. Quick outline of what the purchasing process usually looks like within an organization. We're going to have something the purchase request is going to be the first document and the first thing that will happen, the first process that will happen. So whatever department is purchasing something, they're going to have the purchase request. If we're purchasing something like inventory, we could be purchasing supplies or something like that. Purchase request is going to go to uh, the purchasing department and they are then going to create <laughs> the purchase order. And the purchase order is what's going to actually go to the vendor, the person that we're buying the stuff from. So we're buying stuff, usually inventory, then the purchase order going from us to the vendor. And then we're going to have the receiving report that's going to be generated when we actually receive whatever stuff that we bought. So we can imagine it being shipped. We imagine it shipping to us. We receive it. We got the receiving port. It's going to go into accounts payable at that time. And then at some point we're going to pay it, of course. And that's when we're going to pay it with a check. Now this process is going to be a little bit different than we might think when we purchase something personally online. Because most of the time if we purchase something online, when we buy it, we put the credit card online and we basically pay for it at the time that we order it rather than the time when we receive it. In a lot of purchase transactions, that's going to be reversed in the fact that when we send out the purchase order and we're buying inventory, a general business transaction is often to send out the purchase order, receive the, the stuff, receive the goods, and then pay for it after that point in time. So that's going to be different than you may think or be used to when we're just purchasing things normally, individually, where we pay for it when we order it before we receive the goods and services. Notice that uh, when we record the expense or the assets, we want to record it when we receive it because that's when it's now ours, when we have basically have possession of it. The accounts payable is going to be a little bit different than the accounts receivable in that the payable account is going to be similar, but there's going to be a lot of different accounts involved in the payable process. When we talked about accounts receivable, the other account involved is basically sales is going to be involved. And of course, we're going to pay with cash at some point, but w the sales transactions are all going to be very similar. With accounts payable, we could be buying inventory, which is probably what we're buying a lot for the accounts payable, but we could be putting a lot of expenses through accounts payable too. We could be buying supplies. We could be buying other expenses through the accounts payable. So when we track the, the information through accounts payable, depending on how the company is using it, we could have assets and we could have um, expenses going through the accounts payable as part of that processing process. So remember the difference between an expense and an asset is if we bought something and we're consuming it, that's going to be the expense. So if we bought it, and we're consuming that in order to help us generate revenue in the same time period. That's going to be an expense. That's the matching principle. If, however, we purchase something that's going to be more long-lasting, it's going to help us generate revenue in the future. Something like if we purchased a lot of supplies that we're going to use for the next year or two, then we're going to want to put it on as an asset because we haven't yet consumed it. And then we have the liability accounts, which is going to be including accounts payable. That's going to be something we owe in the future because of something we either consumed as an expense or something that we purchased an asset in the past. So we owe something in the future because we purchased something in the past and either consumed it, either it was an expense or we bought an asset in the past and we incurred that liability, such as accounts payable that we will have to pay in the future, usually being paid with cash. We can break the transactions into groups and think about the transactions in three groups. So we're gonna think about the purchase transactions and the accounts involved in the purchase transaction. It's gonna be the accounts payable accounts will be involved. Inventory could be involved in uh, the purchase transaction accounts. We have other purchases and other accounts that could be involved as well because we could be purchasing, again, other type of expenses. We've got the cash disbursement transactions. 
that's going to be when we pay off the liability. So we're paying off the accounts payable. So then that's going to be cash is going to be involved in that transaction. Accounts payable is going to be involved. We could have a discount as well. So remember, when we think about discounts, it's easy to get them mixed up. We could give a discount to our customers or our vendors could give a discount to us. So remember, in this case, we are the ones purchasing. Therefore, we would be the one getting a discount from our vendors. And then we've got the uh, purchase returns transactions. So remember, this is us returning this stuff because we're talk we are the purchaser in this case. So we could have stuff that we got and we are returning it. And that would include the purchase returns account, uh, purchase allowance accounts, and accounts payable accounts. Now, when we map out this process, we're going to want to do it in a flowchart oftentimes. And many times the company will have a pretty detailed flowchart of the transaction process. Flowchart is going to give that pictorial format. We want we can get that picture of the flowchart and put it right into our working papers. And that will give us the flow that we've talked about that goes through it. And it also gives us an idea of the internal controls. It gives us an idea of when things should be input into the system and who is in charge of the different processes so that we can start looking into the separation of duties. Is there proper seg segregation of duties or separation of duties? through this process which will give those internal controls to reduce the likelihood of some kind of error or fraud happening and we'll get more into that as we go so the types of documents that we're going to take a look at if we'll just list some of the documents and we'll we'll talk more about these as we go we can think about this process we talked briefly about the process we can think about the process by following the documentation through the process we can think about it as following the transactions through the process so we'll talk about it a few different ways but uh, we have the purchase request. That's going to be the request for the goods. So remember, the purchase request is going to be something that if some department, if we in the accounting department want like another computer or something, we're going to have to send the purchase request over. And then the per and then a purchase order will be created. And that's going to include um, description, uh, quality, quantity of goods and services being purchased. And then we're going to have the receiving report. That's going to be records the, receive, the receipt of the goods. So once it's been received, We've got the receiving report. We've got the vendor invoice. That's, of course, the bill. So remember, an invoice, depending on whose side of the table it is, when we uh, write the invoice, it's an invoice. It's basically whoever receives it. It's kind of like the bill from the vendor. Uh, we're going to have a voucher. We're going to have a voucher register to record the voucher. We're going to have the accounts payable subsidiary ledger. And that's going to be our record. So this is us recording the information. So remember, Accounts payable, every every transaction, every account has a general ledger, which is going to be in order by date of transaction, so we know when stuff went in and out of accounts payable. But accounts payable, like accounts receivable, we're going to need another type of ledger. We're going to need to organize that in a different way, that way being by who we owe. So we want to organize it not by when we owe someone. We want to organize it by who, who do we owe. Organize it by vendor. So vendors are going to be the term we're going to always be using when we purchase something and we're buying at a vendor. So then we got the uh, vendor state. We're going to have a check that's going to be involved. And of course, we're going to have cash disbursement and the cash disbursement journal recording the disbursement. Now let's think about the same thing in terms of functions. What are the functions that are going to be happening? So the forms are going to be there and we can see the related functions related to those forms. We're going to have the function of requisitioning. Again, that's going to be the function that we're going to have. We're going to have the requisition process. Uh, that's going to be the in initiation and approval request for goods and services by authorized individuals consistent with whatever criteria or uh, criteria that's involved in the purchasing process. And that's going to be a set of controls that are going to be involved in the requisitioning process. And then we've got the purchasing. That's going to be approval of purchase orders and proper execution as to price, quantity, quality, uh, who's the vendor going to be. We're going to have the receiving function, the function of receiving, which is, of course, the receipt of property authorized goods and services when we actually get the stuff in our warehouse. We have the invoice processing. That's going to be the processing of the vendor invoice for goods and services received. So we're going to have to process that invoice. Then we have the disbursement, which will be, of course, the processing of the payment. So we can call the payments the disbursement. And then we've got the accounts payable function. Recording all vendor invoices, cash disbursements, and adjustments in the individual uh, vendor accounts. And then we've got the general ledger. And we're going to have to keep proper accumulation and classification and summarization of purchases within the general ledger account related to the various accounts that are going to be involved, including accounts payable. 
one of the key functions that we're going to have to put involved in every internal control, remember that all the internal controls are going to have the separation of duties. That's going to be the, one of the first things we want to think of in terms of an internal control process. So what are the separation or segregation of duties involved when we're looking at the purchasing department, the accounts payable cycle? Uh, the purchasing function should be segregated or separated from the uh, requisitioning and receiving function. So the purchasing and the receiving, if one individual is responsible for the requisitioning, purchasing and receiving function, fictitious purchases can be made because we're on both ends of that transaction. This can result in a theft of goods and possibly payment for unauthorized purchases. The invoice processing function should be separated or segregated from the accounts payable function. And that's going to be a, a separation as well. If one individual is responsible for the invoicing, processing, and accounts payable function, Purchase transactions can be processed at the wrong price or the wrong terms or cash disbursement can be processed for goods not received. Uh, this can result in the overstatement of goods and, and theft of cash. Then the disbursements function, the disbursement of the cash function should be separated or segregated from the accounts payable function because if one individual is responsible for the disbursement function and has access to the accounts payable records, unauthorized checks um, supported by fictitious document documents can be issued and unauthorized transactions can be recorded. And finally, the accounts payable function should be segregated or separated from the general ledger function. We usually reconcile those two ledgers, so if one individual is involved of both sides of that transaction, they can make the reconciliation process such that uh, we're not detecting, and it's not an effective process to detect any problems by reconciling those two. We will have to measure the inherent risk as it relates to the, the accounts payable or purchasing process. And that's going to differ, of course, from industry to industry. We don't have control over the inherent risk. And even the company doesn't really have control over it either because it depends a lot on terms of what type of company they are. They do have control over the internal controls related to it. So if we're talking about inherent risk, we're talking about things like what type of thing do they sell? If, if we're purchasing and we have inventory that's, that can be uh, highly valuable and can be stolen more easily, if we're talking about diamonds rather than talking about uh, cars, which might be less easy to steal, or if we're talking about forklifts, it may be less likely that someone's going to steal a forklift or something like that, rather than inventory that's going to be small and very valuable, such as diamonds or things like that. So that's going to be some of the inherent risk factors that we want to consider when we think about our internal controls when we're uh, doing that calculation in terms of how strong are the internal controls, how much testing do we need to do related to them. So that inherent risk factor, and then we have the internal control factor, which is something that is more controllable by the company uh, in terms of the policies they have in place. So within the control risk assessment, we're going we're gonna to hear this a lot because we're going to be doing the same type of control risk assessment when we go through all the processes that we're taking a look at. We want to get an understand of the documentation and the purchasing process for the particular company. We want to plan and perform tests of controls to, in the purchasing process. So we're going to test the controls and then we're going to set and document the control risk for the purchasing process. That's how we're going to set that control risk. We're going to go through and set that risk. So now we've got the inherent risk and we've got the control risk for our equation. Once we have the inherent risk and the control risk, then we can make a determination in terms of how much more substantive testing we want to have, depending on how good we think the control risk is the internal controls are and as well as the inherent risk involved and then we'll set the plan in terms of how much more testing that we need to do in terms of the substantive testing the actual test where we're basically going in there and we're drilling down on the information and pulling the documents as well as the analytical testing more analytical testing those kind of ratio analysis that we'll take a look at assertions related to the transactions these will start to sound familiar as we go through more processes we want to test the assertion of occurrence with regard to transactions, that's going to be the assertion that all purchase and cash disbursements have been recorded and have occurred and are um, in the entity. We want to test the assertion of completeness. That's going to be the assertion that all purchase and cash disbursements that should have been recorded have actually been recorded. Then we want to re test the assertion of authorization. All purchase and cash disbursements are properly authorized. We want to test the assertion of accuracy. Amounts related to recorded purchase and cash disbursements have been recorded appropriately and properly. And then we want to test the assertion of cutoff. We have that same kind of cutoff issue. That's going to be the idea that uh, the end of the time period were the purchases or the expenses that were recorded, were they recorded in the proper time period? Where If we were purchasing something and they were expense items, then we want to see if they should be in December. Are they in December? If they should be in 
the following year in January, are they in January? How do we check that? Usually it's going to be the shipping document. So it depends if, if we count the inventory as ours at the shipping point or at the destination. If it's at the destination, meaning now the inventory changes hands and it becomes ours, not when it goes into the truck, but when it, when it gets to our actual warehouse, then that's going to be the point that we're going to be looking at when we test that cutoff date. So if we got it before December, if it's a year end, then we're looking to see, hey, did it, did it get here? Did we have the shipping document say that it got here before December? Well, then it should be in the December records, either inventory if it was inventory or, um, or some type of expense if it was expense, and the liability should be on the books at that point in time. Then we have the classification. All purchase and cash disbursements have been recorded at the proper account. Controls related to the occurrence and the auditor, when we're looking at occurrence with relation to a cash disbursement, the auditor is concerned with a misstatement of cash being dispersed or recorded as being dispersed when no actual cash left the hand. So that would be the idea of the cash disbursement was recorded, but it didn't actually leave the hand. So how would we, what are the controls related to that? Clearly the separation of duties is going to be involved in the controls related to that. We want to recon, we want to reconcile and review vendor statements. And also the bank, uh, the bank reconciliations will generally catch that kind of problem as well. That'll catch it after the fact, but those are going to be the controls related to this transaction. Why would it catch it? Because, of course, if the cash transaction was recorded, it's not going to be on the bank reconciliation. It's not going to be on some of the other types of reconciliations when we reconcile the accounts together. Then we have the other side of the coin, coin, which is going to be the assertion of completeness with relation to the cash disbursements. So the major, the major audit concerned is that the cash disbursement is made, but not recorded in the record. So it's going to be the other way. We have a disbursement, but it's not recorded. We're going to do some of the same tests of controls. We're going to do the bank reconciliation. We're going to tie out the ledgers. We also might have looking at the uh, numerical sequence of checks. If there's any disparity within the sequence of checks, that's why we have the pre-numbered checks. So when we buy checks from the bank, we have to get the checks that are pre-numbered. And then if we're going to print the checks out of our system, we can't just print the number on them, which we could do because we want to have, but we want to have that check. We want those pre-numbered checks. That way that if there's a, if there's a gap within the pre-numbered checks, then that could be an indication that there's a problem. And then we also want to reconcile the daily cash disbursements, which is another way we can go through this check. That's going to be another internal control related to cash is Assertions related to the accounts, the accounts being the accounts payable accounts and other accounts related to the purchasing process. The assertions related to these account balances will include the existence. So we want to make sure that the accounts recorded in the accounts payable and other expense accounts actually exist. Now, when we think about existence or we think about accounts payable, we're probably less concerned with a liability being reported that doesn't exist. Although that is a concern, it's probably less a concern than the other way, making sure that the records are complete because the liability, we would assume that if a company wants to look better, they would probably be trying to remove <laughs> liabilities from their books, not in include more liabilities in the books. So notice when we think about existence on the, on the asset side, when we looked at accounts receivable, that's one of the major assertions we're looking at. When we're looking at the accounts payable or liability side of things, it's still something we need to test but we're probably more concerned with the assertion of completeness that all account payables and, and other accounts have been recorded, meaning that any liabilities that they actually have are on the books. We want to make sure that if there's liabilities out there that they're actually on the books. Are there rights and obligations? The accounts payable occurrence, do, are they, do they have the rights and obligations related to the accounts payable and other expense accounts? And then the valuation and allocation. Accounts payable and accrued expenses are included in the financial statements at the appropriate amounts and any resulting valuation or allocation adjustments are appropriately made. We have similar assertions that are going to be related to the presentation and disclosure. These are going to be things like the footnotes. We want to have the assertion related to occurrence and rights and obligations, all disclosed events, transactions, and other matters resulting in the accounts payable, accrued expense have occurred and pertain to the entity. We want to have an order of the present presentation and disclosure, the assertion of completeness, all disclosures related to accounts payable, and accrued expenses that should have been included in the financial statement have been included, classification and uh, understandability, financial information related to the accounts payable and accrued expense is appropriately presented, 
and described. Substantive testing that includes analytical procedures, those things we can do in the office like ratio analysis, will include the substantive tests related to the accounts payable process, including uh, compare payables, turnovers, and days outstanding in accounts payable. So we can do that cal calculation, a ratio calculation, in terms of the turnover of the accounts payable. We can compare that accounts payable rate to prior years, past performance, as well as industry standards. And if, and if that rate is off or unusual in terms of prior year or industry standards, that could give us a good indication of a problem that we need to dig into a bit more. We compare current year balances in the accounts payable and accruals with prior years. So clearly we're going to take the dollar comparison and we might take these percent increase or decrease. And we can, again, compare that to prior years and see if that seems typical. If there's an unusually large accounts payable balance at the end of this year compared to the end of last year, why? If there's a very large increase in relation to uh, other types of organizations that are in the same industry, then that might be something that uh, could flag us that we need to check into things further. We can compare amounts owed to individual vendors in the current year accounts payable listing to amounts owed in the prior years. We can look at the actual vendors. And it's going to be important for accounts payable and accounts receivable to look at who they actually owe. Is there a small group of people that they owe money to? If there's a small group of people that make up a large dollar amount, then that could be something that we want to look into further. And we can compare purchase returns and allowance as a percent of revenue and cost of sales. And we can compare those ratios again to prior years as well as to industry averages. Now, one of the major things we're testing for in the substantive testing will be that completeness factor. So as of the year-end cutoff date, we're saying, hey, are all the liabilities, particularly in accounts payable, recorded? And we want to go through that process and ask management about what are the controls over making sure that all the liabilities are recorded. We also could take the policy of looking at cash disbursements that happened after the year-end. Because remember, we're not auditing as of the year-end. The year-end, let's say it's December. We're going to be auditing sometime after December. So what we could do is we can actually take the cash disbursements, cash that was paid in January or sometime after and look for any, any large amounts for cash disbursements and then you know, tie them out to see what their disbursements for. If they tie out to disbursements that we're testing to see if any of those tie out for disbursements that are paying off some kind of larger liability, that's another type of test we can test for completeness. We can also go through and match the actual purchase order and the receiving reports and the vendor invoices uh, to, in, to see if there's any unrecorded liabilities as well. That'll be another test that we can make, some sampling tests that we can have in terms of the assertion of completeness. Testing for the assertion of classification is going to be one of the major things we want to make sure to take a look at in terms of classification because the accounts payable is usually going to be classified as a current liability and we want to make sure that there's not going to be any large amounts in there that are actually long-term liabilities, liabilities that will be uh, payable further out than a year. Remember, that's going to be that arbitrary cutoff date. So we want to make sure that the classification is correct between the current liabilities and accounts payable, long-term liabilities, and any other type of different types of payable accounts that should be broken out. Uh, we want to test for that as well. We can go through the same kind of confirmation process that we do for accounts receivable, meaning in accounts receivable, we went through all the receivables and we sent out the confirmation to a sample of the people that owe the company money. Uh, we could do that on the vendor side. We can go through and test the vendors, but that's not done quite as often because remember on the vendor side of things, when we're looking about the payable, we're not really looking to make sure that the payables are there. We're not as concerned with uh, payable being recorded that it shouldn't be. As opposed to the receivable, we are very concerned that a receivable has been recorded that isn't accurate, it shouldn't be there. Uh, so that's the confirmations are not as accurate in that case, but the confirmations can help with completeness and therefore they could be useful. So they could be something that we implement. They're not implemented as regularly or as much done as they are for the accounts receivable side. Oftentimes we will look for confirmations from their bank. So when we sent out the confirmation to confirm the bank balance, we're often going to make sure that uh, there's no outstanding loans at their major banking institution that are not recorded as well by getting that confirmation. That confirmation asking for any balance that is owed and therefore we can then tie out what the bank says in terms of what they say is owed by the company with what we think is owed and we're probably looking more for things that are not recorded in that case. Once all testing has been done we should gather all the evidence that we have and then make an assertion as to whether 
we believe that the assertions are correct and the and these accounts are materially stated correctly or if they are not correct and not stated correctly and make that determination based on the documentation and make sure that we have the documentation uh, laid out in such a way that a third party can then review it and see the evidence that is supporting our opinion.